book to connect the dots at the end of the conference, I would invite our CEO panelists to please come join me on stage. And as I come up, what we're, we're going to try and do is blend this together. We've heard, please have a seat, we've heard about the incredible changes and opportunities facing organizations. We just heard that your employees are ready for that kind of change. And yet, up till now, the story of a lot of digital disruption, a lot of the innovation has played more to startups. We heard earlier about all the interest in building up the startup ecosystem, I guess implicitly, to disrupt your traditional companies. Um, but yet we have, you know, there's a huge amount of resources, financial, human, brands, in traditional organizations. It seems like such a waste not to transform them. And so my, what I'll do is I'll ask each of our CEOs to first say a little bit about the sector that they're coming from, their, their company, and then where they see the opportunities in their space. And then later we'll get into how to achieve them. Um, I'll leave ample time for questions, so please do be thinking about how you'd like to take advantage of our, our wonderful panelists. Um, Saida, I'll start with you, um, INSEAD MBA from 1984, um, but your other claim to fame is having started a, a small Jordanian company, grown up to become a FTSE 100, which is pretty impressive coming out of a small country like Jordan, especially in a sector like pharmaceuticals. Tell us a little bit about, you know, HICMA, and, and again, where you see the innovation in your sector. Thank you very much, Peter. First of all, I would like to say that the, the decision to get an MBA from INSEAD was probably one of the best decisions I've made in my life. So for those of you <laughs> who haven't done it yet, go out and do it. <laughs> the advertising. Thank you. Um, I, you know, I'd like to say, I'd like to talk about several things that have worked for us so far in helping us grow and then about where I, where I think the future is going to be in innovation. So we are in healthcare, pharmaceuticals. So really, number one has always been and will continue to be having your own R&D team. You have to have your own uh, research and development uh, center to look to see how you can innovate uh, to make n new uh, products. But that's very expensive and it's very uh, lengthy. So what can you do to make this uh, shorter? There is always good old acquisition, right? You, if you don't have it, you can go out and acquire it. You want to. We wanted to enter into the oncology field, for instance. We didn't have the technology. We went out, found a small company in Germany that had fantastic technology, but didn't have a lot of uh, sales. So we bought the company, integrated it, and now we are a leader in oncology globally. We sell oncology globally through that. So acquisitions or joint venturing with uh, innovators is the second way uh, to do that. The third thing is don't get boxed in. Uh, you know, you always try to say, oh, you're a generic pharmaceutical company or you're a specialty pharmaceutical company. This does no longer exist. So in the United States, we are very much a purely generic company. We make, we compete, we sell, you know, and we're doing very well. But in the MENA, we are very much a branded company. We promote our products, we promote to the physicians. So very different companies. Now we're getting into biologics. Uh, we're getting into others. So don't get boxed into you're this kind of company and that's where you should be. No, spread out. Don't, don't be afraid to, 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 to experiment uh, as, as you uh, move forward. Um, where I think the future is, is, as we saw today, it was you know, demonstrated very beautifully uh, in the lecture early on, is the marriage of two worlds together, the healthcare world and the digital world. Technology and healthcare companies once they get, they are getting together, and once they get together, there's going to be, you know, tremendous opportunities out there. And companies that will ride this wave, that will understand and embrace this wave, are going to make, you know, tons of, of, of money. Let me, you know, just give you a simple idea. We know that, you know, we know that in a few years, the technology is already there, but we know in a few years, this is going to tell you, you know, Said, it's time for you to take your blood pressure uh, pill. What I wanted to say is, Said, I want you to take you know, Unsum, which is my brand, right? <laughs> so, so there are many ways that we can, uh, you know, uh, we can use these uh, developing technologies and getting these two uh, sectors uh, marrying and, as I said, making uh, tremendous uh, opportunities for us. 
Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's just also picking up this notion of a direct connection with consumers, mm -hmm. right? A lot of yeah. people who had been much more B2B, suddenly it's like, wow, I've got to go all the way to the end consumer. And I, I think healthcare is one of those. Um, okay, um, maybe we'll go with uh, Tarek. Um, so again, I, I, he was alluding to all the things that, that Larry said about all the different trends. Um, when you think as, as, as CEO of Agility, um, which are the ones that are impacting you? And, and tell, tell people a little bit about what Agility is about too. Well, first of all, Agility is a global supply chain services company. Um, we operate in 100 countries, and uh, throughout our industry, there's one common theme, is that as an industry, we earn between a 2 and 5% margin, and um, it, it tells you how close we are to being arbitraged out of the, the market. So I think it's important to pay attention to some of these, these themes that we talked about uh, uh, today. I think the most important for our industry, clearly, is this concept of the sharing economy. Um, um, if you were to look at the airplanes that are flying around the world, the ships, airplanes, 50 to 60 percent of the, the airplane, airplane sort of space is just basic air. So there's a, we have a long ways to go to become, becoming efficient and being able to actually utilize that capacity efficiently. It tells you how big of an opportunity there is for somebody that can come up with a bright idea better way not to fly air around the world. It sounds ridiculous, but, it's, it, but it, is, uh, it is true. Uh, secondly, the, this, this area, this concept of the cloud. In our industry, the top 20 companies, the largest 20 companies, only have 20% of the market. The other 80% of the market are basically small and medium-sized enterprises that, for one reason or another, the large global logistics companies can't really cater to. Uh, what's the reason for that? You can read a lot, but my gut feeling is that the larger companies are not able to service that segment in the way that they want to be. That they still have very detailed customer service requirements. They have very exacting needs, but they just can't get the level of service that they need from the, the larger companies. And a lot of that has to do with technology and the cloud. And I think going forward, um, what we're going to see is the, that the cloud is really going to enable these, these, these smaller companies to get service, and at the same time, you know, demand more and more service from the larger companies. Thirdly, concept of big data. Um, we, we recently hired a data scientist in our company, and it was quite interesting because, you know, people actually resonated. There were people that said, you actually hired somebody smart for once in a logistics <laughs> company. And uh, um, so clearly, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to figuring out how to use big data. I mean, I think as a company, we weren't um, uh, prepared for it, but we're, you know, we're starting to, to, to plan and think about how to do it. So any of you guys looking for a job in that area, clearly I think that's a, a, an easy avenue uh, uh, to sort of position yourself for, for employment going, for, going forward. But um, I, I think that's gonna be a tremendous, um, have a tremendous impact on the way our industry uh, works. Fourthly, the digital supply chain. Um, I uh, met uh, a few weeks ago the CEO of the Bank of Palestine, who had a problem. I mean, his, you know, there's a lot of security issues, obviously, in, in his country. It's difficult to get payment to, to, to small and medium-sized enterprises. And, you know, credit cards don't really work. Um, um, and so they, they came up with a very innovative way to actually get payment to the, um, uh, to the, mer to the merchants. And, it had a tremendous sort of multiplier effect for the economy in, in, in Palestine. And, in, and initially, um, he, had, he tried to joint venture, I think, with a company called PayPal. It didn't work. He called his PalPay, uh, <laughs> uh, which, is, which is quite funny. Um, they didn't want to have anything to do with it. A few, I think a few <coughs> years later, they came back and said, listen, you know, we, we, um, you know, we want you to stop using that name. He said, I'll be happy to stop using the name when, um, when you come and sort of operate in our market. But the fact that um, that, that these sorts of technologies are required in difficult markets to, to solve solutions that are not, not, not always sort of obvious to us in the sort of developed markets, but in the emerging markets, there are many problems that need to be solved that way, and the best way to do it, obviously, is sometimes through, the, through innovation of the digital supply chain. Uh, two more, and I'll be very quick with these, is the area of um, 3D printing and robotics. Clearly, the way... Um, companies are manufacturing products, it's going to change, obviously, the, our customers' uh, needs and requirements. 
An example is a company called uh, Conformis. Conformis is a company that makes, uses 3D printing to make joints, uh, basically knees and hips. And if you look traditionally at how that business used to work, um, company, the, the surgeon would have um, 15 different size joints in the operating theater and kind of guess which one would sort of, uh, uh, you know, this one's a couple centimeters too big, he hammers it in, changes it. Now they actually can print those joints and it comes and it's delivered sort of, you know, a couple days before your surgery. So you imagine the ramifications for the operating room um, um, in terms of what needs to be sterilized, what doesn't, what needs to be in an inventory, and how that whole cycle works. That, I mean, that's a pretty, you know, you know big, uh, a big change. And finally, this concept of the Internet of Things. Um, uh, again, if you, um, we look at some of the companies that uh, we were, there's a company called Canary, and they, they, they make um, uh, a little security, home security device. And that security device has, has, has a speaker, it has a motion detector, it has infrared, and it's wired, so it's connected to, it's connected to the Internet. That company, um, is probably, if you look at it, it's probably competitive for Siemens and their security systems going down in the future. All of it goes out to the sort of a Dropbox, you have all of your security, and it's for $200. So that sounds like pretty fundamental change going forward for, for all of us. Yeah, yeah. So good, so I mean, it's just always striking. I mean, here you are, and as you said up front, tough, low margin business, in many ways very traditional, and yet, you know, you can rally off, you know, a half dozen trends which potentially are gonna have big impacts, and it's, it's an interesting times. Um, why don't we go to Arjun? Um, okay, so you're a CEO of Philips for Middle East and Turkey. Philips has been one of the big companies that has transformed, has ridden waves of technology. Um, what do you see for Philips going forward? You guys gonna be around in another 100 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sure I'm the oldest on the stage here. Uh, Philips uh, was founded about 125 years ago. It's a long time, and um, I know that many people, I'm sure also in the audience, know the brand. We are in one of the top 40 brands worldwide. Uh, but when I then ask uh, uh, why, it's usually my first radio, my first TV, and sometimes there's even an emotional connection, which is great, which is great for the brand. Uh, the reality is, of course, that we wouldn't been around that long if we were still doing the same things. Um, we're in lighting, also quite a sizable lighting business here in this part of the world which is exciting with connected, uh, connected lighting, light bulbs that become routers, and then uh, energy efficiency. So very different business, and um, I was actually sp uh, asked to speak a little bit more about healthcare, so let me stop here. We also have a healthcare business and a consumer business. And you know, when I talk a little bit more about healthcare, that, that's where we see great opportunities in, uh, in many aspects. And uh, we already talked about the, uh, the rise of the non-communicable diseases basically aging, people going from having an acute event to living with a chronic disease for a very long time. And many of us, in, 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 in two decades from now, 50% of the people in the US will live with a chronic disease. And they probably have a relatively normal uh, lifestyle. Um, of course, there is, uh, as I already mentioned, there is uh, finally IT, IT is coming to healthcare, which makes uh, data storage cheap. Uh, but of course also enables uh, connectivity. Um, and that, that's where we see the big opportunity, maybe in one word for us, the guiding statement is continuum of care. We think it's very important to stop, start connecting the dots in healthcare. Um, consumers are taking ownership of their own personal health. We saw a jaw, jawbone on the stage this morning, but many of you are wearing something that measures your personal health today. And there's a great opportunity to take that, that attitude towards, let's say, healthy living into prevention and combine it with your medical data where you talk about diagnosis, treatment, and home care. And I think connecting those five steps, and we, we, we call, call out these five steps, that for me is the big opportunity that we call continuum of care. And maybe just to leave you with an example, and, and I think it's an example that also shows that this is not a dream, this is possible today. Um, and I think it also shows what an opportunity that, uh, that Continuum can offer. Um, today, we, uh, in cooperation with, with others, because it's complex, so we have to work together, are treating chronic heart failure patients. We do that in different parts of the world. Um, but I was in Singapore before, we do it in Singapore. 
And you can find in the scientific literature that if you treat chronic fa heart failure patients at home, so basically you prevent that they have to go to the hospital. And if they go to the hospital, they are the most expensive patients um, in, the, in the cost pyramid. So if you're able to do that, you actually see outcomes that are 30 to 50% better in terms of cost and in terms of quality of, of care. And I think that's where healthcare is going. It will all be value-based, outcome-based, and we see a huge opportunity there. Uh, opportunity there. Yeah. <coughs> no, I mean, healthcare is a fascinating one because huge part of the economy, huge pressures in most countries on the cost side. You think digital could be part of the solution, and yet, as a sector, actually driving the change in healthcare is one of the hardest. So we'll, we'll come back in a second. But first, um, Andreas um, here, actually, I think, as more as chairman of um, Barry Calibo. Um, what do you see in the sector in terms of where there's pressures for change? In well, first, let me share with you who is Barry Calibo. It's probably the company that's the furthest away from healthcare. We produce <laughs> chocolate. <laughs> and we produce chocolate since 1840, so 170, 180 years. And it's pretty much the same product, same ingredients, same way of processing chocolate. So we are probably the company that has resisted the most to innovation. Yet, of course, you know, in the world of obesity, where consumers demand for more healthy products, we are a little bit under pressure because we're the second largest purchaser of sugar in the world after Coca-Cola, and we produce, we use a lot of fat, so we're not healthy at all. <laughs> so at some stage we thought, you know, with Obama administration coming in and chasing us through the courts and uh, the corridors and so on, we said we have to work on more healthy chocolate, which of course you all don't like because healthy chocolate sounds like not tasting chocolate. So who would buy chocolate that doesn't taste? So we were, of course, first doing a bit of innovation on the recipes, changing sugar into artificial sugar, and you know, less fat or maybe more healthy fat. But to me, honestly, that's not innovation. That's standard renovation. It has nothing to do with innovation. So let's not confuse renovation with innovation. So we had to go a little bit further. And I went back, and we all went back in the company, looking at the books of our children, the books of history. Where does cocoa, the main ingredients of chocolate, where does it come from? If you read the books how the Aztecs in Latin America were burying their kings in these huge, wonderful, beautiful pyramids, they put lots of cocoa next to the dead body. And you think, why that? Is that the new perfume or so? No, it was used as a medicine. So how can the key ingredient for unhealthy chocolate be a medicine? So we went to the laboratories and checked it out that there is about 230 very healthy elements in a cocoa bean. The stupid problem is that since we make chocolate since 170 years, all these healthy elements and the process of making this cocoa first and then the chocolate, they all get lost, nothing left. So we were working on how can we keep all these elements, the flavonols, polyphenols and so on, in the chocolate. And that became, I'd say, not a renovation, that really became an innovation. Which means today we can pretty much say in which chocolate is how much flavonol, polyphenol and so on. Because we are not a consumer brand company, we are a B2B company, we are kind of the intel of the chocolate companies, uh, it is our obligation to do all this and then sell the chocolate to the cookie guys or the chocolate ice cream guys or the chocolate guys or a hotel like this. We have to make sure that you know we innovate chocolate. So we now can say how much polyphenol, flavonol is in the chocolate, we can actually, we found the process of keeping these healthy things in there by going all the way to Africa, to Indonesia, to Brazil, where the chocolate comes, the cocoa comes from, and by changing the fermentation process in the jungle, which is, of course, a huge challenge because we have to reach about three, four million cocoa farmers to do this. But that's, I think, was on our side 
innovation process on the product, on just on the product. But let me finish with that nice example by saying, um, first, innovation, don't confuse it with constant renovation. And I gave you the example of cocoa ingredients versus just you know replacing sugar with artificial sugar or fat that is more healthy. And the other thing, of course, is uh, I believe that innovation really is something that is a DNA of a company. It's a culture. It doesn't come through a good idea alone. It's much more. And I hope we will have time to share this here on the podium to how to create innovation, um, not just as one idea, but as a culture in a company. Very good. Thank you, Andreas. Um, I think I'd like to pick up on what Andreas just talked about. Two things. One, coming back to, with um, Syed again, you know, how, wh what have you learned about how to lead innovation in, in a large company? And again, you don't have to pick up on this, but the other thing that comes up, what you see, and especially some of the examples Andreas brought up, oftentimes innovation stretches beyond your organization, right? It's not enough to just create the product here. You have to s get the suppliers, the, the customers also to innovate. Um, but again, either just inside your company or in the broader ecosystem, yeah. what have you learned about leading innovation? Again, because you know our company started in a small country like Jordan that is not known as being a, a power base of innovation uh, and so on. So we had we are not by you know by our DNA an innovative company. We have to learn and as I said, find ways to to stay ahead of our competition. As I said, one way was to acquire a uh, joint venture and acquire companies and technology. The other thing that we have just uh, did to stay up to date with the innovation and the digital world and others is we have created a venture capital fund now. And that fund uh, you know, will be managed by experts, but its sole uh, purpose is to follow up on where the technology is going, to invest in uh, biotechnology to invest in uh, tech, you know, technology, digital technology, and so on. So the, the point is you always have to find ways to give yourself an edge. Uh, if you don't have it, find ways to get it. If it's not in your DNA, find ways to get it into your DNA. So this, uh, we found that is very helpful, you know, the venture capital fund that we have uh, opened up a lot of doors for us. Uh, it allowed us to interact with so many new innovators, and hopefully, you know, we can take uh, deliver some of that innovation back into our company. Very good. Yeah. So again, this theme of being open. Maybe we'll, maybe why don't we s jump over to Philips? I guess you've been, your company has been in this game for a while. Um, as you said, they don't, you know, make TVs anymore. You've had to move. What, what's the sort of wisdom in, in Philips about how you stay relevant? Yeah, I, I think that, um, um, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's a fundamental decision. Uh, we, like every company, we have limited amount of money to spend, um, and we decide to spend 8% of our sales on innovation. And that also means that if you spend that money on innovation, uh, you potentially cannot spend it on marketing. So I think that's a very conscious decision. Um, I think every company takes their own decision, but that's a decision that Philips has taken over uh, over the years. I think we also have a lot of you know, processes in place to, to build on uh, what Andreas said to make sure that, you know, innovation I don't think is uh, something that uh, happens by coincidence. Uh, you need to be having structured processes in place so that, um, so that you can deliver consistently over time. Um, one of the ways we think about it is making sure that you have consumer insights uh, driving your innovation processes, that everything between, uh, let's say, the engineer that is thinking about the next innovation and the person closest to the customer is as lean as possible. Um, but I think the last word that you used uh, in your question was relevant. And you could say that the main thing that is driving our innovation today is locally relevant. Uh, and if I can just one, give one example, I'm sure that we have money, many fathers, but certainly also mothers in the audience. Uh, and if you're uh, pregnant, you go for an ultrasound. And I think we all know ultrasound as sizable computers and they're wheeled in on the cart and you know you get an image and, and you can do it 3d sometimes even 4d and and the technology has developed as well but we have to realize that also in this part of the world there are many pregnant uh, ladies that are quite far away from hospitals and they will not have access to that kind of technology so today um, we, we we have two different things uh, we we um, we give to midwives uh, an app on their phone everyone has a phone also also here 
And what they can do, they can visit pregnant women in Indonesia, they can collect vital signs, and they, through normal bandwidth, they communicate the, uh, the data to a hospital, and the hospital will then, uh, will then triage. Uh, so very simple ways to get uh, uh, high-end um, um, knowledge uh, in rural areas. But going back to the ultrasound, uh, if you remember that big machine, now uh, the small piece that was touching your belly uh, and that actually created the image, that is now the size of an ultrasound. Hmm. And that you can take anywhere. We even give it as a rental model and you can stick it on your own uh, wireless to your own mobile phone. So that, ha that means that you have sort of your own mini diagnostic ultrasound with you and obviously it can go anywhere. And for me, that's a good example of how you can create something big, high-end for an environment where that's appreciated, but you can also make it small, portable, and of course at lower cost for environments where that uh, is the most uh, uh, pressing need. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe over to, to, to Tarek at Agility. So as you said up front, you're in a, here you're in a business, lots of change, but low margin <laughs> environment. How do you reconcile the need to innovate with being in such a sort of a, a, a tough low margin environment? Well, it sounds like our advisory board discussion. <laughs> and there's two, there's two groups. There's the one group that says, you know, this, all this sort of technology, some of the things that we talked about today, really is, at the end of the day, is not going to be that relevant to our business because you need boots on the ground. And they point to examples of failed um, 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 areas of innovation. And there's two, I think, in, in our industry that are quite topical. Um, a company um, uh, called UTI embarked on a major transformation technology um, investment program. At the end of that transformation, they couldn't process invoices Sounds really, and, and, and that company basically is almost out of business uh, today. Just, you know, so, so, they, so we have people on our board say, look, you know, you gotta watch out, innovation can basically put you out of business. Um, at the other, the flip side of that is, you know, we early on in the 90s, we were early adopters of um, some of the technology we talked about today, Cisco, and, and sort of getting our, our, our systems with those high level visibility. So we were able to, we, we, we thought there was gonna be a tremendous demand for this replenishment. And it, it was also a colossal failure, to be honest, because we spent all this money, and um, at the end of the day, we, we could see Amazon basically offering the same services that we had offered to our customers, but none of our, none of our customers were really ready to, 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 to pay for that. So, um, but out of that failure, today we can trace $10 billion of business opportunities that came our way because of the investments we made in, 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 in technology and the way we reconfigured our, our business. So it's clear to us that, 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 that as a business, we need to change, we need to change quickly, but we can't at the same time throw away the business that we have. We want to disrupt it, disrupt it at the right time, but we, you, we cannot afford as a business to put ourselves out of business. So how do you sort of make those things work together? I think this idea of this big bang approach really doesn't work. I mean, that's, a, that's something that, and then many of the technologies that we talked today, about today allow you to experiment on sort of a small scalable way and then to sort of scale up that experience. So that's really helpful with these new, these new concepts out there. Um, two, don't distract your core business in the beginning. And when you're trying to innovate, my own feeling is that if, you're, if your core business, the guys that are in, in your core business, they, they're there to, to, to run a business, they have very strict things, schedules to meet, do the innovation outside of that core business, and, um, um, but make sure that that innovation is, is agile and scalable, and you can use a trial and error approach to sort of uh, 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 implement it. I think also it's very important to innovate from the inside and the outside at the same time. You can't just take ideas from the outside and implement them, nor can you take ideas inside, and you have to be m sort of somehow doing both of those at the same time. And then finally, the last thing is once you know that you're on the right path, that's when you need to make the, the tough decision to cannibalize your own business, um, but you can only do that after you've gone through a pretty um, uh, um, uh, difficult learning process. Thank you, Tarek, very good. Um, Andreas, you, you raised the question, so let's, let's maybe come back to you on that. 
you know, as you worked on more healthy chocolate, you know, way upstream in your industry, what kind of things did you learn about, you know, what, what works, what, what doesn't work? Well, as I said earlier, I think innovation is really is a culture, is something you need to bring as a DNA of your company. And how do you get there is not easy. And I'd like to mention maybe three elements to it. And two of them have been mentioned before. Um, so let me start with the third one, which uh, I think helps innovation tremendously is very simply is growth. Uh, if you are in a company that is basic like chocolate, where the whole wa market, world market grows 1.2% in the last 10 years, and if it's a great year, it's 1.5%, if it's a bad year, it's 0.7%. So if you're in a flat environment, you have to create uh, growth well above market. So you can do this, but you know what I'm saying is growth generates ideas. Only if you have growth and you allow the people to grow above market, you can generate ideas. All these food companies, and I re refer to the 3G culture, which we hear you know, from InBev to Kraft to Heinz, uh, all these uh, companies are focusing clearly on cost cutting, on cash, great for shareholder returns, but bad for innovation in the long run. And I hope history books in 10 years will write about it accordingly. Growth helps and has helped us tremendously. We have tried to find ways to grow at least two to four times market, and then helped us be very innovative, um, be smart, and come up with a new way of cutting business. But let me come to the other two points. One has been said, which was change, and we heard that before with a quote uh, on uh, Jack Welsh from GE. And uh, change, of course, is an easy word. Eh? Change, you know, you gotta change. Why changing? Well, I think fundamentally, change uh, is something that requires questioning your today's and yesterday's position. Uh, there are companies that have been um, super successful in the technology world that tremendously pushed for change. And um, behind change, of course, are the great minds. I mean, I've just been to uh, Korea last week and in South Korea, which has just been elected or you know, the, as the most innovative country in the world, there are companies like Samsung. I mean, there is a quote from this chairman of Samsung, which is quite fun, which is, you know, you have to change everything, everything, except for your wife and your children. <laughs> and that made Samsung, you know, with the owning family, really a successful machinery. Um, so a lot of philosophy of change. Um, the other key word, for the culture, I think, has been said, which is um, the leadership. So another word, which is a password, but leadership, what does it, does it really mean? And I think it has also been mentioned, leading was, in the old days, was one is running in front, everybody has to follow. This is over, especially with globalization, especially with a more complex uh, market in the world. Why is it over? Again, globalization, different cultures, and complexities have requested for a new type of leadership. The new type, I would call it, it's not you're leading people. The art today is you lead through people. That's what we heard about in terms of empowerment. Empowerment means you lead through people. And I think that creates the entrepreneurship in the company. We used to say in our company, we want an enterprise of entrepreneurs. Everyone on each level has to feel like an entrepreneur, be responsible about tomorrow, even the simplest worker on the third or fourth level of the company. So we're trying to create an ecosystem in the entire company that is entrepreneurial. And I hate to see sometimes these big corporations, they basically say, okay, we are way too back big and this great little idea, venture cap like, we're gonna move outside the company because otherwise it's gonna be killed in the company. And then we'll try to foster it there. It works, yes, Nespresso as an example, but in a way, it's a shame, you know? There is hundreds, thousands of people in Nestle working on that big thing that kills good ideas, and so they have to move it all the way outside to be successful. And that's not good. I think we should always have the aim to 
be entrepreneurs in your enterprise and create that culture in your total company and don't come up with the second best solution, which is moving it out. So again, it's em about empowerment. It's about an ecosystem that is an um, entrepreneurial, a startup thinking system. And again, I think the key success for creating this is this feeling of ownership, of entrepreneurship of each and every level. This, I think, has helped us a lot. And uh, I think, you know, if we can create that wherever you are in the world, fantastic, you will be the innovator. Thank you, Andreas. Let me um, pause and open it up. Let's see if we have some questions uh, for our panelists. And just remind you to briefly introduce where you're coming from uh, as you answer as your question. Yes, here in the front, please. Just wait, the uh, mic will come. No, it's good. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Muhammad Yusuf Benyas, uh, Abu Dhabi Education Council. My question is to the colleagues: uh, Why you find sometimes the, you know the practitioners in the medical field they are more resistant to adopting technology and to change? What's the reason? What's the root cause and reason behind that? Thank you. Did you get, who, I, I heard this. I heard resistance to change for adopting new technology. Who's resisting? Uh, yeah, so let's, yeah, so let's talk on the, uh, it would be interesting to, to delve a little bit into the medical side. You know, what is it really going to take to, to move the, the, medical, uh, the medical ecosystem in the way that we have to, given some of the pressures? I'll, I'll put you, Saeed, on, on, on the spot first. Um, yeah, I don't know if I'm going to answer that directly, but a few years ago, my daughter was interning. Uh, she spent the summer uh, at Hikma with us. And after, you know, spending eight weeks, she, you know, she rushes into my office and says, Dad, you hire the brightest kids. Because we have, you know, this is something we really, you know, hiring the brightest is something that's very high on our agenda. So we really put a lot of effort. So she says, Dad, you hire these ultra bright kids, you know, bright people. And then you make them follow the most rigid rules. So you kill all of their, you know, you kill any innovativeness in them. I said, wow, you know, it's like a, a nice, you know, ice water bucket thrown on my head. So you can't do that. You cannot do that. You really have to uh, usher in uh, an environment that really uh, uh, empowers uh, individuals, and especially those with entrepreneurial uh, skills or, or, you know, they, they want to do something. You have to empower them and allow them. You know, allow them to do them. Give them the resources. If they do a mistake, you know, don't be. You know, don't. It's, it's okay. You learn from your mistake. You move on. So you have to usher in this, uh, you know, this environment of uh, uh, accepting change and uh, adopting change. Are they saying? You know, the, the medical industry is is very regulated. This is a problem. You know, it's a very highly regulated uh, industry. You have the FDA and the Emirati. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, you know uh, the medical uh, society, so it's very highly regulated, and we don't have a lot of, you know, but, but when it comes to innovation, you have to give, uh, you know. So I, I want to give an example of, of something. In, in the United States, we are a generic pharmaceutical company. And by definition, generic is not innovative, right? Generic is, is a copy, <coughs> is a copy of the innovator. Uh, we are a leading supplier of injectable products to the hospitals. So typically, the medicine is put in a vial, and you sell it to the hospital. The, the nurse takes you know, the needle or, or the diluent, puts it with this, and then takes it out, and then gives it to the patient, then has to find a way to get rid of the needle. So we developed, so uh, the innovation was not in the, in the medicine, because as I said, it's a generic, you cannot develop it. But we developed uh, a delivery system, a new delivery system. So we developed a pre-filled safety needle. So the medicine is pre-filled into the, so it's the, the, the nurse doesn't have to dilute it or uh, you know, measure it. It's, it's, it's already exactly the amount. And then after it is uh, injected, the needle retracts automatically inside the, uh, so something like this, you know, it's, it's innovation not in you know the medicine but in the delivery system and it you know we are patenting it now and it's going to open um, tremendous opportunities so there are many ways to do innovation but i go back to the, the, you know what we're talking all about you have to usher in you have to create an environment 
that rewards entrepreneurship, that rewards people that think differently, that allows them to think differently mm -hmm. and give them the means uh, to, you know, to do what they want to uh, do differently than the rigid way, old way. Very good. Uh, uh, I, I, yeah, please. I, I, yeah, go ahead. No, it, of course, healthcare has a reputation of being a very uh, conservative industry. My father is also a doctor. So the discussion that we have at home is that we always did it this way, it should continue, and then I say, but we cannot afford to continue. And that is where we then agree. Um, and I think that is one of the great things in healthcare, that uh, the urgency is so high. Um, there are governments that are making calculations that going forward, you know, between 20, 30, maybe even 40% of GDP has to be spent on healthcare going forward. Now, that's unsustainable. Um, I think there's a great opportunity for, for markets in this area to actually leapfrog and, and build a system for the future. Uh, so, so in my view, at the end of the day, you always need to go back uh, to the need. Uh, you need to find partners that ha share the same vision, and there, there are many uh, doctors that have a great vision, a great vi vision for the future. Uh, what we try to do is, is find those people uh, and make sure that we uh, build upon each, uh, each other's strengths uh, and find a way forward to a complex uh, environment. Very good, thank you. Um, how about we go in front here? Yes, yeah, can I have a mic? Hi, thank you for the um, excellent insights. It's uh, good to hear from CEOs uh, or leadership who are actually running businesses. So. I'm, the, uh, I'm a founder and CEO of my own contract staffing and outsourcing firm. So we are around this Gulf region. So I started from zero and uh, we've gained some scale now. So my questions are essentially on, on two parameters. The first one is as we scale and go more regional and global, um, you know, it, it's hard but you have to keep drilling standardization and process to scale. And uh, to run innovation parallelly is difficult because you, you tell the same guys, you know, follow process, but then you also tell them to disrupt the process and be innovative. So how do you strike a balance between that, between standardization, which is necessary for scale and innovation and disruption? That's the first question. The second question is, I don't know if there's a difference between large companies like yours or listed companies and an entrepreneurial firm where Yes, you encourage failure because that's the essence of innovation, but how much do you lose? How much is okay to lose? You know, is a million dollars okay? Or, or in this chaos, do you put budgets that, you know, in the whole year it's okay to lose a million or 10 million, uh, but you know, not the 11th million? How do you uh, quantify that failure or loss, which, which might even encourage failure, but uh, encourages uh, innovation That's at the right. same time. I think you, you put your, your finger on one of the tensions, I think, in what you guys have been saying. On the one hand, I think, you know, um, Tarek, you talked about, you know, the, the challenge of a big innovation push in the core, and suddenly a competitor couldn't ins issue invoices. On the other hand, you know, you, you, you see the challenges. Andreas talked about, you know, as a big company, you just want to stick your innovation on the side. And, and I think what you're asking about is that tension but especially in, in a company that's growing and globalizing. Anyone um, wanna? Yeah, let me take the first yeah, one. Thanks, Andreas. You know, th because we've been growing very fast, uh, sometimes we were missing structure. So let me share with you um, how we balance, and that was the first part of your question, how we balance growth, entrepreneurship with structure. Um, I, th I think <coughs> you need, clearly need certain structures you need structures in parts of your businesses that you cannot afford not to structure. And that, of course, obviously is somehow finance. I mean, there is only in a company one way to write the books, the accountings, <laughs> and have the financial reportings and measure financials. So that's only one thing that needs to be standardized. The other one is, in my view, is what you define as quality in your company be it the quality of a product, be it the quality of a process, the quality of people input. And that's, again, a culture that you need to somehow standardize. And you cannot afford individualism over quality standards. In today's world, when I look at our product as a food product, we cannot allow risk on quality that hits safety issues uh, above you know, individualistic designs and ideas and so on. 
And the third one is, in a way, uh, for structure is, um, uh, is HR. I think today you need to have a backbone of HR. Why? Because if you don't have, let's say, proper feedback systems, um, feedback meaning uh, how are you doing, how is, do you, when do you get promoted, transparency on the career, you will lose a lot of people. You might grow very fast, but you lose a lot of people, especially when it comes to millennials. We heard about millennials. Henrik Bresman spoke about millennials. They leave four to five times faster when you don't give them proper uh, feedback systems. And uh, I think HR, certain standard HR is essential. Then there is some simple stuff. I may mention finance, of course, IT and so on is essential. Everything else I would leave very much entrepreneurial. Yeah. I'd like to, to, to add to that. I, I keep remembering something my father always used to teach me as we start, you know, we, we started in the Middle East and then we went to Europe and then into the United States, moving to Africa and Asia. So we have 28 different nationalities in, in the company today. So how, how, how do you manage, you know, uh, this diversity and how do you keep them focused? So the thing they always taught, used to tell me, Said, there, there are values and there is culture. Values never change, okay? Quality is quality, honesty is honesty, integrity is integrity. So you have to teach everybody the same values. Everybody has to be tuned in, know exactly what the values are, and everybody has to abide by these values. But culture has to adapt, it has to be adaptable, because you cannot use what works in HR in, 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 in Jordan to, to use it uh, in China or use it in the United States. So you have to adapt the culture of the company as it grows, as it you know, takes more different uh, nationalities in, you have to adapt it to be more adaptable to where you, 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 know, you are going. So values never change. You teach everybody the same culture. It has to adapt to... to uh, one thing that we have found very... Uh, and, and this is, I think this is a major problem with all multinational companies, is where is the, you know, where is the center of, of control and power? Is it centralized at headquarters? <coughs> One thing that we have found to, to be very uh, helpful with us is that we have decentralized the... Uh, so local leaders have a lot of authority, have a lot of responsibility, uh, and accountability, of course. Um, we have you know, one global plan, but then the execution and the innovation in, in the management in that different division is really up to the CEO of that different division. So you know, I hope this is helpful. Uh, yeah, please, yes, yes. You touched a nerve. Okay. Two, yeah, two, two quick uh, comments. Um, in 1997, we had 300 employees. In 2006, we had 30,000. So in that process, I can assure you there are many situations where you didn't have the right, you know, systems or procedures, but, you know, so, so sometimes it can be a good, uh, um, a good problem to have if you're, if you're, if you're growing in your business. But I think the answer to the solution, the solution that you need to look at today is if you were to survey the companies, maybe in this room, how many of them have ISO programs? They'll say, oh, we have ISO 5001, 15, they all have them. But what, what are they? It's just a group of documents where the, you know, the auditors come in, they stamp the, these things, and they say we have these, these qualifications. Those, in my opinion, those, th those sorts of programs and systems really add, in the end, they add no value unless you put them in technology. You have to put them into your workflow, into the way that your, your, your business um, interacts with its customers. And all the technologies, all the sort of ideas that we talked about today make it easier today than ever to actually put that, embed that logic into the way you want um, your, your organization to be empowered and the way you want it to work. So you can, you can be 100% empowered, but you can also be 100% controlled on the areas that need to be controlled. And that's why I think it's so important to like, think about how to use these technologies to, to make the business grow. That's great. Um, well, maybe yep. uh, I'll keep it short. No, that's good. Um, some guideline that has helped me is more the first part of your question. You know, even if your umbrella is, is innovation, um, I, I think there are areas that are customer touch and areas that are non-customer touch. Non-customer touch, we should standardize, centralize away from the customer. Customer is not interested. It just needs to be done, like sending invoices, for example. 
um, and that you could run almost for uh, productivity. Uh, then you have bread and butter businesses, uh, they are customer touch, but I think you need to make sure that the innovation there is more in the area of continuous improvement. So you continue every day to improve these businesses. And then you have a third category, which, may, which is maybe around creating the future. That's where you will find new capabilities, and I think you need to find ways to strengthen them, uh, make sure that different capabilities can be leveraged, um, and that would be my sort of guiding principle in these discussions. Very good. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, right here in the middle, please, Ibrahim. Uh, <coughs> Ahmed Dabbar from Emirates Identity Authority. Thank you for this uh, interesting discussion. Uh, my question to the uh, panel is like you are a CEO of multinational companies. Uh, my question to you is what the message you will deliver here to the leader of business in UAE and in the, re in the region to adopt innovation. As you know, government is going to innovation. We have a lot of businesses that are going to innovation. And as Andreas mentioned, innovation is a culture. But for us, innovation is a culture, but it is, should start from the leaders. What's your message to the leaders here to adopt innovation and to go forward for the new century? Thank you. Very good. So as, as, as you said, part of things need to adapt to the region. So I think it's, it's a little bit around what does it take, what have, what have we learned about leading innovation, particularly in this region? And maybe if I could possibly broaden the question, you, you mentioned the authorities. What's the proper role of, of local government in creating you know, the, an environment where you can do what you need to do as, as business leaders, um, particularly in this region? Anyone want to? Yeah, please, that's good. Well, I think if, if you look if you look at the Middle East, um, two notable uh, uh, exceptions, uh, Saudi Arabia and the UAE, um, by and large, the, the economies here are very difficult to do business in. So if you were to actually benchmark uh, the countries in the MENA with global standards, you'd find uh, that, that if we could just get up to 50% of global best practice in terms of making it easier to do business in the Middle East, um, we, we, uh, the growth situation could improve 20, 30 percent. So a country could get 20, 30 percent more GDP growth just by making it easier to do business. So I think the number one, I think, going forward, especially in the Middle East, the number one concept that we need to focus on is that we have um, close to 100 million people that, are, that, that, that don't have jobs. And you're not going to be able to create those jobs if the, the, the environment, the business environment is so difficult that the SME segment is being stifled. So entrepreneurs in most parts of the Middle East are being stifled by the bureaucracy. Again, you look at the emerging markets, nine out of every 10 new jobs are coming from the small and medium-sized enterprise segment. So it's almost like the Middle East is consuming the medicine that needs to make itself better. And I, you know, if, I think, if I could look at one thing, I think going forward, I think we need, as a region, we need smaller government, we need easier um, um, uh, uh, ways to do business. And I think if we do that, I think it'll, you know, we'll, 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 we'll get a lot of mileage out of those two simple ideas. If, 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 I, uh, if I may add uh, to, to uh, what Tara said, the educational systems need to be changed, need to be overhauled in the Middle East uh, to, to start, you know, teaching children not just to to memorize, uh, but to, to think and to, uh, to explore. Uh, I think you know, what the UAE has done a you know, fantastic job in bringing schools like INSEAD in, into the region and others. This definitely changes the way that you know, education uh, is taught and how people uh, think. So we have to concentrate, not just at the university level, we have to concentrate on changing the education system from, from, the, from the beginning. Uh, to teach you know kids to be more inquisitive, to be more experimental, to you know to, to think on their own rather than just read and memorize what they read. Very good. Okay, um, we have some more questions. Uh, Leonidas, please. Thank you, Thank you panel. Um, my question: I'm Leonidas Slas. I'm a graduate of the class of 1975 and on the board of INSEAD. Um, my question to you is: How much do you factor political disruption? into your thinking about innovation? 
and how can innovation possibly help in making the world a more peaceful place in the areas that have this disruption? <laughs> or just, you know, in general, the, the, the issue we, about uncertainty know, in the environment. Being doing business in the Middle East, you are born into political <laughs> disruption. It's everywhere around you. And uh, actually, you know, it, it, it plays a huge role. Uh, you know, one year Iraq was our biggest market, the second year it completely disappeared. And that really, you know, can, you know, can have a major impact on, uh, on your, your business. In North Africa today, the currencies are losing their value so fast. So again, you can sell as much as you want, but the more you sell, the more you lose. And of course, that is all due to, or a big part of it is to the uh, political disruption. So it is something that you have to build in your planning system. It has to be you know, built in in the planning system. You have to have, when we present annual budgets, they, they, they present, uh, you know, they do have alternatives, you know, plan A, plan B if something goes wrong. Um, one of the reasons why we decided to go outside the Middle East and become more international is this, is also to become more diversified, diversify our risk geographically. And you have to diversify your risk from the products that you have. You know, the more, you know, hopefully the more products you have, the more uh, diversified. But yes, definitely it takes, you know, it plays a big role in, in our planning process. We, you know, we continuously think what might happen here, what might happen there. Is it a good time to invest in Egypt? Is it, is it a good time to invest here or that? So you have to you know, keep a very close uh, eye on it. And you have to, if you can, stay connected to the uh, governments of the regions if, as much as you can stay connected. Part of my job is to visit the Minister of Health in every country I go to. It's a big, you know, it's a big part of, 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 uh, of what I do is to stay in touch with you know, their thinking and what's going on. I, th I, th I think that uh, if, if I look back in the past, I'm sure many, many big companies did portfolio management, right? And you had areas where you were able to go in and, 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 and have a return and maybe other areas where you had to take a short break. What we've always tried to do is make sure that we always stay connected, uh, even in, in difficult times. And that has helped us because we've seen that countries have always come back, come back stronger. And I think those that remain committed uh, to the area or to a particular country always uh, were the ones that, you know, were maybe the first to be given a chance to help uh, build something up if that was the possibility. When I think about, go, think about it going forward, this may not be enough. And, and especially I came 10 years ago for the first time to the Middle East and I think there's quite some volatility at the moment. So I think we, we need to start thinking about how we can use that to our advantage. I'm not sure that we have figured that out. Uh, but one of the things that we're doing, we have the Phillips Foundation and we're working in that Phillips Foundation with uh, UNICEF and with the International Red Cross. So we're trying to learn from them how they operate in, let's say, volatile environments. And we see a huge opportunity to team um, with those kind of uh, uh, world-renowned institutions. And uh, uh, this is more CSR. But learning also helps us to, devel to develop mi business models that can be sustainable in uh, volatile environments. Okay. Yeah, please. I mean, the growth in emerging markets is still, it's better than the developed economy. So if you take that as one overlay, and then t take for a moment a company perhaps like ours that has, has its roots in the, in, the, in the Middle East. We started in the Middle East and we're the only um, one of the, in the top 10 players in, in the supply chain business globally because of our roots in emerging markets. What does that mean? That means when we, when we look at an, a, a geography like Africa, we can often make the business case that, you know, it's not much riskier than doing business in our home market. Um, it, might be, it might be even, I mean, the way, if you, if you really look at how things are developing in Africa, we're seeing some re good examples of governance there at, at some of the, 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 the country levels. In many cases, better than uh, than countries in in the Middle East. Uh, so, having you know, starting from an environment, a risky environment like this, makes you makes you perhaps more tolerant and more open to look at risks that are necessary to take um, to actually achieve a value proposition for your for your for your for your, for your global customers. And at the you know, end of the day, if you take take Nigeria, Nigeria. Um, I think they consume about 50,000 automobiles a year, roughly the same size as Brazil, which is two, I think three million. So 
you look at that and you say, well, okay, what, what, how can you explain that difference? In Nigeria, it's probably two or three new roads or major highways would actually triple the demand of, of uh, uh, or consumption of vehicles. So, you know, you, you look at it and say, well, then maybe that's an interesting place to, to, to start developing a, a future. It's difficult, yes, but, um, um, you know, you, you have to be there. Your customers want to be there. And coming from the Middle East is, I think, an advantage. I'm going to now, unfortunately, wrap things up. I'll ask each of our panelists if you want a, a final word as, as we also look to, to wrap up the, the conference today. Um, as the topic is open, although I'll, I'll just say one thing on theme is I often talk to our young MBA students who are today increasingly you know, debating to what extent should they go and work like they all used to for big traditional companies and help you with your challenges versus you know, the increasing dream of going to a startup or to a smaller, smaller ventures. Um, so you know, final thoughts, but including on this question, you know, to what extent are we gonna see more innovation and action um, in the big companies going forward? Um, Said, I'll uh, well, kick us off. Yeah, um, you know, again, what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to do is instead of building, like you said, the big traditional company is, is to build a combination of small entrepreneurial companies. So instead of having one big rigid company, let's build smaller companies that are more entrepreneurial, that are more managed by uh, people from, you know, from that particular region uh, and, as I said, giving them more uh, opportunity and, and, and the responsibility. So that way you can still attract uh, you know, don't present yourself as a big rigid company, but as, as I said, more entrepreneurial. So you can attract the kids that are more entrepreneurial, that want to, you know, we saw they want to get to the point where they make decisions, where they have the power to make decisions very quickly. So you should do that. Uh, one thing that we are not hung up on is, is experience and age. You don't have to be, you know, 20 years in the company before you reach. No, if you're smart enough, you're driven enough, and, and, and you know, you're innovative enough, you can be, you know, you can be in a position of power at a much younger age. I think that's, that's very important. That doesn't have to be, you, know, you have to wait for the next the guy on top of you to leave or die before you get into their <laughs> position. You can actually, you know, jump over them if, if you're qualified enough. I wanted to give just one, one last word to, to you. In this region, manage cash flows, okay? Cash flows are much more important than profit and loss and sales. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, uh, very good. Tarek, uh, closing thoughts for us. Well, for this, I think, group, I think um, if you have a, the opportunity to work for the government or work for the private sector, start your own business, definitely try to start your own business or work for the private sector. Uh, I think the, the, the last thing that we need in, in this region is more government, bigger government. We need smart people to work in their own businesses, and we need them to basically be the agents of change going forward. So resist that, that, uh, that opportunity that comes from you. It looks nice, the paycheck is nice, the but in the long run, it's probably not the best, uh, I think, opportunity for you. So make a contribution today. Arjun, some final yeah. thoughts for us? Yeah, I'm not sure that my career has been a, a product of great planning, uh, but I, I came from elsewhere here. Um, and you know, I think the role of the CEO is, is maybe not so traditional anymore, the way I look at my own role is that my, my reason for being here in this area is that I do new business development. That is what I do, that is my key role. There are a few things that I maybe do on the side. And I, I think therefore the question, you know, should you go startup or a big company, I think you can do entrepreneurial stuff and you can develop new business, new business models, you know, in any location. And, you know, ultimately everyone then basically have to decide where they feel themselves more, uh, more at home. Thank you. Andreas, any uh, last thoughts for the group? Well, I, d I always say uh, to my friends that ask me the question, uh, three things have to be super good, have to be all right. The first thing is, and it's irrelevant, sorry, it's, it's irrelevant whether it's a small company, big company, public or not public and so on and so forth. The first thing is the product. You have to love the product. You have to develop passion for the product. Many people, like, you know, if you have to sell derivatives of a bank, you don't really get passionate about a derivative of a bank. <laughs> if you get passionate about chocolate, talk to me. <laughs> if you get passionate about education, talk to Ilian or Peter or to me. That's a great product. 
The second thing that has to be okay, of course, is the salary and the compensation structure. Easy, you can calculate what you need. Number three, you have to look at your boss. You have to love working for your boss. The boss is the symbol of the culture of the company. If you like your boss and the culture of the company, you're fine. So product, payment, and the boss. Thank you. Thank you. Please join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs>